This is yet another example of two rocks floating in space and crashing together. You're going to see a lot of examples like this because two rocks floating in space crashing together is a very convenient demonstration of a collision in a situation with no other forces involved. No friction, no gravity, no air resistance. All we have to care about is the forces these rocks exert on each other as they collide. So what should we expect to be conserved in a collision like this? What's not going to change from start to finish? Total mass. The total mass is not going to change. Uh, at the beginning, the total mass is 80 kilograms. Afterwards, the total mass of the system is still going to be 80 kilograms. Uh, also, what else could, what else has to stay the same in total? If this is an isolated system and they're not interacting with anything else except each other, yeah, total momentum has to stay the same. So the initial system, initially the system is 80 kilograms of mass and some specific vector for, for total momentum. After the collision, after they hit each other, the total mass is still 80 kilograms and the total momentum is still that same vector. The individual momentums can change. Rock A is not going to have the same momentum after that it did before, uh, but the total momentum is going to stay the same. Because the only way total momentum can change is if what happens? What's the only thing that can change the total momentum of the system? Yeah, an external force, a force from something else. During this collision, A exerts a force on B and B exerts the same amount of force back on A in the opposite direction, Newton's third law but there's no external forces. So they exchange momentum. One of them is going to gain momentum in some direction. The other one's going to gain momentum in the other direction, but the total momentum does not change. So a very useful way of organizing the information here is this idea of a, of a momentum chart. If we just list out momentum for A, sorry, I want those as rows. Initial momentum for A, for B and for the total whole system. Change in momentum and final momentum. So this is usually how we set up a momentum chart. Again, just a way of organizing the information here. And what of this can we figure out right now, just based on the given information? Yeah, we can figure out all the initial momentum stuff. Initial momentum of A, how do we calculate the initial momentum of A? Momentum in general is what? Yeah, mass times velocity. So we multiply the mass of A, 50 kilograms, times its initial velocity, 20 meters per second. 50 kilograms times 20 meters per second is 1,000 kilogram meters per second. And since momentum is a vector, we need to list not only the magnitude, but also the direction. So we would say 1,000 kilogram meters per second to the, let's call this to the east. Let's just use standard compass directions, north, south, east, west. So we'd say this is a thousand kilogram meters per second to the east. So we will draw that as a arrow pointing to the east. Label the thousand. And I'm not gonna bother filling in the units in every square on this chart because they're all the same units. I'll just make a note of that up here that everything's gonna be in kilogram meters per second. And what about for object B? What would be the initial momentum of rock B here? Yeah, 30 kilograms times 40 meters per second is 1200 kilogram meters per second. And that'll be in this direction because uh, momentum is always in the direction of velocity since mass is just a scalar multiplier. So 1200 in this direction. So we'll draw that as an arrow in that direction. It's a little bit longer than this one because it is a larger vector. 
So can we add those just by adding 1,000 plus 1,200 to get 2,200? Like that. Yeah, that doesn't actually work. Why can't we do that? Right, they're not in the same direction. If they were in the same direction, like if you had, let's say, 1,000 in this direction plus 1,200 in the exact same direction, then the result would just be 2,200 in that direction. But these are not in exactly the same direction, so we can't just add the magnitudes. What do we have to do instead? What's probably the best way to add these vectors if they're not already in the same direction? Yeah, splitting it into x and y components, and that way we can just add the x components together and add the y components together. So let's find the x, y components of these. For object A, it's already purely in the x direction because east, the direction it's traveling is the x direction. And this isn't just because I've drawn it horizontally. This is because we're essentially using the motion of A to define our x, y coordinate system. We're basically just setting up x, y coordinates where X is the direction A is traveling and Y is the direction perpendicular to that. If the, if the vectors are drawn in a way that's not already having one of them horizontal or one of them vertical, I would recommend setting up your coordinate system to make one of them horizontal or to make one of them vertical in your new coordinate system. So we can just create a coordinate system where one of them is purely in the X direction or purely in the Y direction. And that's gonna make the subsequent math a lot easier because the way we set this up, what are the x, y components for rock A? The velocity would be 20 comma zero. But what about the momentum? Yeah, 1000 comma zero. And by the way, you could do this in either order. You could multiply mass times the magnitude of velocity to get 1,000, and then split that up into components, 1,000 comma zero. Or alternatively, you could split the velocity into components, in this case, 20 comma zero, and multiply both components by the mass. You can do this in either order. A scalar multiplier can be multiplied by the magnitude, or it can be multiplied by both the x and y components. The only thing it doesn't change is the angle, the direction of travel. But either way, we get 1,000 comma zero as the x, y components. Uh, what about for B? How would we find the x, y components of uh, this vector? How could we split up that 1200 into some amount in the x direction and some amount in the y direction? Yeah, if we just use sine and cosine, that should do it. Because if we draw out that triangle, we've got 1,200 along this side. I want to split that up into some amount in the x direction and some amount in the y direction. Let's say px and py. This angle is 37 degrees. And py is the opposite side, so that will use sine, sine of the angle is in general opposite over hypotenuse. That'll be PY over the magnitude, 1200. So PY, just multiply both sides by 1200. <clears throat> and there's the value of PY. And for PX, we can do the same thing. We'd just be using cosine instead of sine. So PX is gonna be magnitude times cosine of 37. And you could do this by drawing out the right triangle, or you could use the fact that as long as you're talking about angle from standard position, if you're measuring the angle from the positive x-axis counterclockwise, as long as you do that consistently every time, then the y component will always use sine and the x component will always use cosine. That's specifically if the angle is measured from the positive x-axis counterclockwise. If you're measuring it from any other axis, this won't work. But if you set it up exactly that way, measuring the angle from the positive x-axis counterclockwise, then the y component is sine and the x component is cosine by definition. Either way, that gives us the values of 
x and y components. So let's push those into a calculator or a trig table and see what we get. 1200 times sine of 37. Am I in the right way there? Yeah. Is about 722. And 1200 times cosine 37 is about 958. So our xy components, I'm just going to write as parentheses here, a coordinate pair, 958, comma 722. And I'm rounding off a little bit, but not all that much. And now that we've got these in components, how do we write out the total momentum? We just, you add the x's individually and then the y's individually. Exactly, we can just add the x's together. 1,000 plus 958 is 1,958. And then y components, 0 plus 722 is just 722. So that's the xy components. And that's going to be a long ways to the positive x direction, but the same amount in the y direction as this one. So our actual vector is going to look something like this. And now that we've got that, what do we know about the change in total momentum in this system? Yeah, we know there's no change to total momentum because this is a closed system. There's no external forces modifying it. So the change in total momentum will be the zero vector. Not just the number zero, but the zero vector written as a zero with a vector sign over it. The zero vector just means a vector whose length is zero and whose components are zero comma zero. And that's important to write out as components because then we can just add these together. 1958 comma 722 plus zero comma zero because we can find the final momentum by just adding initial plus change. The final momentum is gonna be the same as the initial momentum because there's no change. 1958 plus zero, still 1958. 722 plus zero, still 722. So the final total momentum is exactly the same as the initial total momentum. Of course, we still don't know how that splits up because all we know about these values is that final momentum of A plus final momentum of B equals this total. But there's still some unknowns here. We still have two unknown values. We don't know this value and we don't know this value. So this alone is not enough information. You can't tell what happens afterwards just from what happens before if all you know is this information. You need to know more information about this. And that generally consists of one extra fact about the final motion. Maybe you know which direction A is traveling. Maybe you know which direction they're both traveling at the end, but you just don't know how fast they're going. Or maybe you know the complete final velocity of A. You know exactly which direction A is going and how fast, but you have no idea where B is headed. Or maybe you know they stick together. Or maybe you know that uh, an energy is also conserved. And that ties into the idea of elastic versus inelastic collisions. If a collision is elastic, that just means the final total kinetic energy is the same as the initial total kinetic energy. Momentum, we're generally going to assume is conserved in any closed system. But kinetic energy doesn't have to be conserved because kinetic energy can turn into other forms of energy. And that's what we mean by an inelastic collision. Inelastic means that some of the kinetic energy has been lost by turning into other forms of energy. But generally we calculate that at the end. If, if, unless the collision is elastic or the collision is inelastic is some of the given information, I wouldn't worry about that until the end. Usually at the end, you would calculate kinetic energy before and after and check if they're the same or not. But let's say the other piece of given information is that, let's say they stick together. Let's say we are watching the system afterwards and we don't really measure how fast they're going, but let's say we know they stick together. So they collide, 
we form one larger rock, AB, whose mass would be 80 kilograms. <clears throat> so for purposes of the momentum chart, we don't want to change which objects we're talking about halfway through. We don't want to start with an A column or an A row and a B row and end up with a single combined rock row. We still have to treat A and B as separate objects. So what we're going to do, we're going to imagine that A and B are still separate objects. Even though they're stuck together, we're going to treat them as two separate rocks that just happen to be moving together as if they were stuck. So we can still calculate the individual momentum of A and B. Uh, it's just that they happen to be moving together. And if they happen to be moving together, what has to be the same about them? Right, they've got to have the same V final. So even though we, we don't know what that V final is, we can write out the momentum as mass times V final. For A, the mass is 50 kilograms. For B, the mass is 30 kilograms. So we know the masses. We don't know what V final is, but we at least know it's the same V final. And that reduces this from an equation with two unknowns to an equation with one unknown. The only unknown here is V final. We know this plus this equals this. So if we set that up as an equation off to the side, we can solve for V final. So let's try that, since we know V final is the same for both because they're stuck together. And that's generally true, by the way. Anytime you've got two objects that are stuck together or tied together by a rope that's fully stretched out and is not stretching or compressing, as long as the objects are moving together, they have to have the same velocity. And if necessary, you can also say they have to have the same acceleration. Otherwise, they wouldn't really be moving together. So off to the side, we can say 50 kilograms times V final plus 30 kilograms times the same V final equals that final total momentum. And if it's the same V final in both of these terms, what can we do with these two terms? Can add them together. Yeah, we can just add those together, combine like terms by, ultimately we're just factoring out V final and we get 50 plus 30. So that's 80 kilograms times V final equals P total, total momentum. And then how do we isolate V final? Yeah, if we just divide both sides by that 80 kilograms, V final is just going to be the total momentum divided by 80 kilograms. So we can take the total momentum we've got here in component form and divide it by 80 kilograms, and that should be the final velocity in x, y components. A couple of other notes on this. If we're just combining like terms because they have the same final velocity and we get 80 kilograms, what is 80 kilograms? What does the 80 kilograms signify here? Yeah, that's the total mass. So even though we, we set up this equation by still treating these A and B as separate objects, uh, the fact that they have the same final velocity means that they do combine to act like just one object anyway. So we're still treating them as separate objects for purposes of the momentum chart, but mathematically, the fact that they stick together means they do really act like one single object with a total mass of 80 kilograms. And also in general, if you know the momentum and you know the mass, you can generally find the velocity by just dividing by mass. Mass is the conversion factor between momentum and velocity, the coefficient of uh, proportionality. So if we do that, if we actually write this out, V final equals, we know final total momentum is in component form 1,958 comma 722. And I'm gonna go ahead and fill in the units we've been leaving out because that's going to be important in this step. Kilogram meters per second divided by 80 kilograms. And the reason I'm filling in the units here is now that we're actually doing some calculations with this, what happens to the units? If we've got kilogram meters per second divided by kilograms, what's going to happen there? 
It ends up being meters per second, which is just the velocity units. Kilograms cancels out. We're left with just meters per second. And that's exactly the units we should expect for velocity anyway. <coughs> so keep track of units. Uh, as you're working through calculations like this, fill in the units in any values where you know the units. Uh, keep track of where they are, what cancels out, what's still there, what combines. And keep in mind as you go through this, uh, what you expect the units to be in the end. If you get that, great. If you don't get the units you expect, that probably means something's gone wrong and you have an idea where you should go back and check for errors. So it's a good, uh, a good check on your work as you go along, making sure the units work out properly. And then to actually divide that, how do you divide a vector by a scalar? What do we do with this 80 in terms of the actual calculations? Like how would I actually punch these numbers into a calculator or write them out in long division? What do, what, what do I divide by what? You have to do it separately, right? So you would do one, uh, 1,958 divided by 80 and then two, I mean, 722 divided by 80. Exactly, we take each component separately and divide by 80. Because when you're multiplying or dividing a vector by a scalar, that influences all of the components. So the X component divided by 80 is about 24 and a half. Y component divided by 80, 722 divided by 80 is about nine. So those are the X, Y components of the final velocity. We can now say confidently that the final velocity has an X component of 24.5 and a Y component of nine. So final velocity is gonna look something like this. <clears throat> and moreover, we can also figure out how fast that's actually going. If we wanted to know how fast is this object actually traveling, what would we do? How would we find the magnitude of the velocity here? Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, we can just use the Pythagorean theorem, 24 and a half squared plus nine squared, and then take the square root. So Pythagorean theorem always works to convert the XY components to the magnitude. And I'm getting about 26.1. So Casey, I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, so if the objects end up stuck together, how can they have different, like why is the PF you don't count the mass as 80 for both when you, like why don't they have the same PF if they're stuck together and it's the same object? Uh, if they're stuck together as the same object, they have the same velocity because they're moving together. But to find the momentum, you would multiply the mass. If you want to find the momentum of just piece A, you'd multiply the mass of piece A times final velocity. To find the mass of piece B, you would just multiply that mass times the final velocity. So the, the total momentum is just the 80 kilograms times the final velocity but the individual objects can still be treated as having their own momentum. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just like if you're, let's say you're just drifting down the street on a skateboard, your whole body has a total momentum, but you could also say your arm has a certain amount of momentum, your head has a certain amount of momentum and so on. And you could find that by multiplying like the mass of your arm times the final velocity or the velocity of the whole thing. So the individual pieces can be treated as separate for purposes of calculating momentum of each piece. Okay, thank you, that makes sense. I think my intuition for momentum was slightly off. It's tricky because I mean, we're, we're, I think we're a lot more accustomed to thinking in terms of velocity. And if an object is moving together, then all of its pieces have the same velocity. But momentum is a combination of velocity and mass. So the different pieces having different mass means they have different momentum, even though they're all moving at the same speed. And I think a, a key to this mathematically is that momentum is additive. If you've got a collection of objects that are moving, you can add their individual momentums to find the total momentum. But this also means if you've got one object that's moving and you can imagine splitting it up into different pieces, 
you could split up the total momentum to find the momentum of each piece of that object also. It's, it's additive and it's also, I guess you might say decomposable or I think dissectable is the word used in geometry, that this shape can be split up into smaller shapes and the, the property of the whole shape, the total momentum is split up into the individual pieces of the shape, not evenly, but proportional to mass. Any other questions on that so far? So we now have the magnitude of the final velocity. We know how fast the combined lump is traveling. But since velocity is a vector, we should also be able to figure out this missing angle here to figure out which direction this object is actually traveling. So how do we find that direction? If we know we have this triangle whose side lengths are 24.5 and 9, and of course it's a right triangle by definition, how do we find this missing angle theta? Yeah, arc tangent or inverse tangent will work just fine here. <clears throat> because we know that the tangent of the angle should be opposite over adjacent. Or as long as you're talking about, again, the angle measured from standard position, from the positive x-axis counterclockwise, uh, opposite over adjacent will always be y over x. So you can just say, in general, as long as you're talking about angle measured from standard position, tangent of theta will always be y over x. Even if it's some weirder angle that's more than 90 degrees, uh, as long as you're measuring from standard position, tangent is always the y component over the x component. And then we in, uh, apply the inverse tangent to both sides. Inverse tangent applied to both sides. On the left side, tangent and inverse tangent cancel out. On the right side, we take the inverse tangent of this ratio. Because tangent function takes an angle as input and gives you a ratio as output. Inverse tangent function takes a ratio as input and gives you the angle as output. So we punch this inverse tangent into a calculator or look it up on a trig table. And we get about 20 degrees. Running off a little bit, more like 20.2 degrees. But there's our angle. 20.2 degrees. So that's the angle that describes the direction of travel here, that this combined lump of rock is traveling at a speed of 26.1 meters per second at an angle 20.2 degrees north of east, or however you want to describe directions in space. Any questions on that so far? And in some situations that might be that might be all we care about. Maybe we, we're just trying to figure out which direction and what speed the final combined object is going and that's it, in which case we could stop here. But there's more stuff we can figure out here. Maybe we wanna know more information about the final momentum and change in momentum for each object. So we could fill out the rest of this momentum chart. We now have enough information because we have the components of the final velocity. So let's go ahead and fill in the rest of this. Final momentum of A, we can just multiply 50 kilograms, the mass of A, times that final velocity, which we just found, uh, presumably in XY component form. You could also multiply the mass times the magnitude of the final velocity to figure out the magnitude of the momentum of A. But since we're gonna need to do further calculations to find the changes, it's gonna be, I think, easier to work exclusively in terms of XY components for now. So let's multiply 50 times both of these components. So 50 times 24.5 is 1,225. And then 50 times nine would be 450. And likewise, we could multiply 30 times both of these components. 30 times 24.5, 735. 
and 30 times 9 would be 270. So that gives us the x, y components of both of these just by multiplying each mass individually times the x, y components. And we can now draw in those force vec those uh, momentum vectors. We've got a large amount to the east and about a third of that to the north. We've got a, about half of that, a little more than half of that to the east and a third of that to the north. <coughs> so something like this. And if you want, you could also fill in the magnitudes of both of these by calculating x squared plus y squared and then take the square root, the usual Pythagorean theorem. The angles should all be that same 20.2 degrees though. You could certainly check that by taking the arc tangent of y over x, but it should, be, it should follow that they're the same, same angle because they're all traveling together. And as one more check to make sure that this all fits together, you could add together x component plus x component, get y, uh, a new x component, y component plus y component, get the total y component. And those are not quite gonna work out here. If we add 1225 plus 735, you're gonna get close to 1958. I think that's 1960, 1960. And likewise, 450 plus 270 is 720, not 722. So why are these not quite fitting perfectly? Why don't these truly add up to exactly this? Was there anything we were doing during these calculations that would lead to that being a little bit off? Would it be because of the rounding? Yeah, and, and a lot of these steps, we were rounding off a little bit <coughs> uh, and not very much. Like this, uh, this final velocity, the 24.5, that was pretty close. I only rounded it off to like the tenths, the, the tenths place. But when you multiply that slightly rounded off number by a fairly large multiplier, that escalates the error. The error gets larger and larger in terms of absolute amount. So. Uh, having an error in the ones place here makes sense because we had uh, we rounded it off to the tenths place here. So we're going to have an error in the tenths place multiplied by something in the tens and we're going to get an error in the ones instead of in the tenths place. So we are going to get a little bit of inaccuracy here, but as long as it's pretty close, we can say that's probably just due to rounding error. Uh, also, we've got these missing spaces in the middle here. What, how would we fill in these spaces in the momentum chart? And what do those actually mean? Yeah, delta momentum can be calculated by just final minus initial. And you can do that just one component at a time as well. <coughs> if you just subtract final x minus initial x, 1225 minus 1000, that's just 225. And then final y minus initial y, 450 minus zero is just 450. So that's a little bit to the east and about twice that much to the north. So the change is something like this. And you can even see that in terms of a head to tail addition. Initial plus change should equal final. So initial plus change equals final initial plus change equals final. So those all seem to fit together. Likewise for B, final minus initial, 735 minus 958 is negative 223, is that it? Let me double check that. Yeah, negative 223. And then 270 minus 722, negative 452. So that's 223 to the west, because it's negative, and 452 to the south, because that's also negative. So something like this. And what do you notice about those two changes? Yeah, they're equal and opposite because what do they have to add up to? Right, these values, the changes have to add up to zero because it's a closed system. If there's more than two objects involved, like let's say this was a three object system, 
the, ch the three changes wouldn't be equal and opposite to each other, but they would still have to add up to zero. So that's really what you want to check. Do the changes add up to zero? And in terms of the components, do these components actually add up to zero? Not exactly, but again, this is just a rounding error. They come pretty close to adding up to zero and we can attribute that to just the fact that we rounded off some of these decimals. You can get more accuracy by carrying it out to more decimals or by leaving your, your value, instead of like writing this as 20.2 degrees, you could leave it as inverse tangent nine over 24.5. Of course, that gets really messy the more calculations you go through. But if you need more accuracy, just take the, de take the numbers out to a few more decimal places. Uh, and what do these values tell you? When we've got the changes in momentum, what is that? What, in, what information can we get from that? Why would that be useful? What has to happen to cause a change in momentum? Yeah, there's gotta be a, well, for the yeah, net force on the object. Uh, so this momentum, this, this change in momentum for A is caused by the total force acting on object A. This change in momentum for B is caused by the total force acting on object B. But what's applying a force to A? What's applying a force to B? Where are these forces coming from? Each rock is experiencing a force from, yeah, from the other rock. So this change in momentum is, a, is caused by a force acting on A from object B. This change in momentum is caused by a force acting on object B from object A. So in this case, this is, why, this is also why they're equal and opposite. Each rock is experiencing a certain amount of force in a certain direction. Those forces are equal and opposite and those cause equal and opposite changes in momentum as well. And you can even calculate how much force is experiencing if you know one other thing because how are force and change in momentum related to each other? What equation ties those together? It's delta T, right? Yeah, if you multiply force times delta T, the amount of time the force lasts is also known as impulse. The impulse, or really the total impulse, tells you the change in momentum of the object. There may be several impulses, maybe there's several objects exerting forces, but if you add together all the impulses, all of the force times time acting on the object, that tells you the change in momentum of the object. In this case, there's only one force acting on the object, just the force from the other rock, so we don't really need to worry about adding forces and adding impulses together. Instead, we can just solve for force by doing what? How do we isolate force here? Yeah, divide both sides by the change in time. And change in time here just signifies the amount of time the force lasts. Uh, the amount of time between the objects first coming into contact to the objects settling into their new position of velocity. So the change in momentum we know, if you take that change in momentum and divide by how much time the collision takes. Uh, so we would have to know that, that would have to be more given information. Or if you had like a video of this process taking place, you could just play it frame by frame and count how much time it takes from the instant they first make contact to the instant they stabilize their new, their new motion together. So that's the amount of time the collision takes. If you take the change in momentum in components presumably, and divide that by how much time it takes, that will tell you how much force is involved, how much force that rock is experiencing from the other rock. Again, in X, Y components, but you can use the usual Pythagorean theorem to find the amount of force in Newtons and uh, inverse tangent to figure out the direction the force is pointing. So that's often a useful extra piece of information you can find from the center column here, the change in momentum column. You can use that combined with how much time the, for the collision lasts or how much time the force lasts to figure out how much force is involved. Any questions on that so far? Um, so just to clarify the way we found PF, um, uh, 
So we took the mass of each individual rock and multiplied it by the VF that we found for the total, like that magnitude. Usually? Yeah, so we, we, we took the magnitude. So the VF equals 24.5 comma nine. And so then we did the Pythagorean theorem to find the magnitude. And then we multiplied the mass of each rock times that magnitude to get the total. And then we um, also found the angle. Oh, what I would do is leave it in component form. You could certainly multiply like, for instance, 50 kilograms times 26.1 meters per second to find the magnitude of the final momentum of A, and then use the angle to split it into components. But since we already have the components of the final velocity, it would be a lot easier, I think, to just multiply mass times final velocity in component form. Oh, okay, okay. And you could Thank do you. that. You could multiply the mass times the components or multiply the mass times the uh, magnitude. They have the same effect. But since we're going to be doing, in general, anytime you're going to be doing further calculations with some vector, I would leave it in XY component form because almost every single calculation is easier to work with if it's in components. The only exception I think is if you're, if all you're doing is taking a vector and multiplying it by a scalar. In that case, I would just multiply the magnitude by that scalar and keep the direction. Or if all you're doing is adding together two vectors that you know for sure are in the same direction. In that case, you can just add their magnitudes. But any, any calculations more complicated than those, I would uh, just have everything in terms of components throughout the entire process of calculations. And then find the magnitude and direction at the very end if you want to get more useful information. Okay, thank you. And then also one more thing just to clarify is you're saying that the, the PI, or no, sorry, the PF angle for both A and B has to be the same. Is that right? Uh, these angles here? Yeah. Yeah, because they're traveling together. They're, they both have the same, they're, they're, I mean, the, the, the angle for momentum is describing which direction the object is traveling. If these objects are traveling together, then they're traveling in the same direction. So they're going to have the same angle. Okay, and then so and then again, this is all for like an elastic collision. So if we got an elastic an elastic collision equation or problem, would they have to tell you what angle they bounce off of each other uh, at? Yeah, this is specific. So the, the calculations we did here with uh, like fifty times unknown v final plus thirty times the same unknown v final, the assumption that it's the same v final does rely on the fact that they stick together. If they hadn't stuck together, if they had bounced off each other, we'd need more information. Uh, and that more information is generally going to be something like knowing which direction one of them, or it, it, maybe we know which direction both of them are traveling, or we know the actual final velocity of one of them. We just don't know the final velocity of the other. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But in general, as long as you can narrow it down to just one unknown vector, then you've got it. Uh, and also the idea of elastic versus inelastic. Elastic just means total kinetic energy is conserved that the initial total kinetic energy of the system is the same as the final total kinetic energy of the system. And you can check that just by calculating the total kinetic energy both before and after. And from way back in uh, 7a, what's our usual formula for kinetic energy? Uh, one half mv squared. Yeah. So I would calculate that individually for rock A before for rock B before, and for the combined final object, and then compare the total final momentum to the total initial momentum. So one half mv squared plus one half mv squared, that would be the total initial kinetic, total initial kinetic energy. And then separately, one half times mass times velocity squared, that would be the final total kinetic energy. And you want to compare those. If they're the same, if the final total kinetic energy of the whole system matches the initial total kinetic energy of the whole system, we say that the collision is elastic. Elastic in this context just means total kinetic energy is conserved. But that's very rare. Most of the time, you lose at least a little bit of kinetic energy. Sometimes you lose a lot of kinetic energy because there's no law of conservation of kinetic energy specifically. We will assume that the total energy of the system is conserved. But that's total energy, not just kinetic energy. Kinetic energy can change to other forms. Maybe it turns into thermal energy as the objects get slightly warmer. Maybe it turns into bond energy if the objects partially change phase. Maybe it just leaves the system as like during a collision, maybe it makes a lot of noise. That sound leaving the system is a loss of energy. So energy can leave the system in other forms. 
in this case, if you actually run this calculation, uh, so try it out yourself. Try calculating the initial kinetic energy of both objects and add them together, and then calculate the final kinetic energy of the combined object. You should end up with no uh, noticing that the final kinetic energy is much smaller than the initial total kinetic energy. This system loses a large amount of kinetic energy during the collision. So this is a very inelastic collision. And that's ultimately because they stick together. If objects stick together, they have basically lost as much kinetic energy as they possibly can during this collision. They can't just come to a stop in this case because the total momentum is not zero. But by colliding and sticking together, they've lost as much kinetic energy as they possibly can while still going through conservation of momentum. So anytime objects stick together after having been moving separately, they're going to be losing a large amount of kinetic energy. If they bounce off, they might be elastic or might be inelastic. They might have lost some kinetic energy. So you'll need to actually run the calculations and check. It's also possible that they end up with more kinetic energy than they started with. That's usually called a hyper-elastic collision or a super-elastic collision. Uh, but that only happens if there's some other form of energy already in the system that turns into kinetic energy. Like maybe there was a compressed spring that expands and pushes off when they collide. Then the spring kinetic spring potential energy turns into more kinetic energy. Uh, but that's only possible if that extra energy is already in the system in some other form. Any other questions on that? All right, then I will see you next time.